First speaker uh, to is going to be Mr. James Dorsey. He's going to be speaking on soccer and how it has a change of identity in areas. Um, this is a free series for anyone that's interested to watch and view. And if you'd like to be a speaker or have a subject later that you'd like to hear about, please let us know. Um, you can always visit our website at culturalknowledge.org for more information. And if you have any questions, uh, please hold them till the end. You can type them in the chat question and answer box. And then uh, Mr. Dorsey will answer them at the end. And uh, now I'd like to present to you Mr. Dorsey, sir. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And good evening, good morning, whichever it is, to everyone. And welcome to what I call the turbulent world of Middle East soccer. I apologize that you don't see a picture of me, but unfortunately the camera on my computer did not, uh, did, did not want to uh, cooperate. What I'd like to do is set the scene with two very brief videos and then try and explain a little bit of what um, I'm arguing. Uh, so let me first start with the first video. I should warn you that in the second clip there is uh, foul language, uh, but that is part of the scene that we're discussing. Here we go. مش مجرد جيم مش مجرد مباراة العالم شعوب العالم كلها بتخرج تحتفل أو تخرج للشوارع بالملايين لسببين اثنين فقط لا غير تغيير واقع سياسي أو تأييد واقع سياسي أو بسبب مباريات كرة قدم بس I'll just put on the second uh, video and then we'll launch into all of this. just saw were two videos. The first video is a professionally made documentary and the key word in it is to my mind soccer is not just a game. The second video is a video which was made by the ultras white knights that is the um, militant 
uh, highly politicized, violence-prone, street battle-hardened support group of the Crown Cairo Club Zamalek SC. Uh, and the key words in that were, in the musical overlay that you saw, uh, are, it's all so fucked up here, I, there's no breathing space. The pictures you saw are what a typical soccer match in Egypt looks like. Often it's the, uh, the fireworks, the smoke guns, the flares are such that you do not see the match. Soccer pitches in the Middle East and North Africa are battlegrounds. They are battlegrounds for political control between autocratic regimes and um, these militant soccer groups. They're battlegrounds for groups that want to assert national, ethnic, sectarian identity, and they're battlegrounds for uh, women's rights. I'm going to try and focus, first of all, on the, the, battle, the political back battleground and then touch briefly on the two other battlegrounds where we can go into greater detail in that um, in the question and answer session. Essentially, so there is nothing outside of religion that is as popular in most of the Arab world, and most of the Middle East for that matter, including Iran, Israel, and Turkey, than soccer. It's a passion that is so strong that autocratic regimes need to come to grips with it. They cannot simply suppress it. You've had other forms of dissent, of trying to carve out uh, niches and spaces, such as, for example, underground music, for autocratic regimes, that was easy to deal with. You just threw a couple of musicians into a prison, or you stopped musicians from entering the country at the airport, and nobody, if they even knew that that was happening, cared. Soccer is like the mosque. It, is, it involves the mass of the population, and you can't just simply cut them off. So for autocratic regimes, this posed a threat because the mosque and the soccer pitch were really the only two institutions, or places if you wish, where uh, people could congregate and could express pent up anger and frustration. Because the regime couldn't cu simply cut them down, it needed to control it. And in doing so, regimes recognized that there actually was not only a threat here, but also an opportunity. And the opportunity was one if, they, if regimes and autocratic leaders could associate themselves with something as popular as soccer, then maybe they could help improve their, uh, and polish their tarnished images. It also allowed them to distract attention from um, unpopular policies, discontent that was widespread, and third of all, it allowed them to manipulate political uh, or, or national emotions just think back to late 2009, early 2010, when Egypt lost its qualifying match for the uh, South African World Cup uh, against Algeria. And Mubarak, uh, as well as his two sons, whipped up national emotions that went as far as bringing e Egypt and Algeria for the f uh, to the brink of war. It was the first time that two nations came that far since 1969 soccer war between Honduras and um, El Salvador. Diplomatic relations were broken off. An Egyptian telecom company was um, slapped with a half a billion dollar supposedly tax fine. It took um, the former Libyan leader, Colonel Gaddafi, to try and quiet down the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tension. For the soccer fans, starting in the early 2000s, they, these were militant fans dedicated to their clubs, uh, and most of them were professionals. One of them, the godfather of, um, of the ultras, certainly in Egypt, uh, is a man who's a, uh, uh, a journalist. He's a former United Nations fellow. He's an uh, instructor in uh, new media. And most of these guys were essentially anarchists. They were relatively, you know, relatively well-to-do or well-to-do enough that they had access to the internet. 
And as they surfed the internet, they came across militant soccer groups, primarily in Serbia and in Italy, much of which, uh, much of whose beliefs, not so much politically, because a lot of these groups had right-wing tendencies, but their beliefs in terms of soccer coincided with the beliefs of the Egyptians and gave them the framework to fight the attempts of the autocratic leader to control what they considered to be their space. What it meant to them to be an ultra or a militant soccer fan was that they were fiercely loyal to their soccer club. They viewed everyone else as mercenaries and pawns of the regime. Soccer players were there for the money, and if someone offered them a, a, a better deal, they would switch clubs. The soccer management were all uh, appointees, or at least approved by the Mubarak regime. They're therefore pawns of the regime. So as far as the soccer fans were concerned, the stadium was theirs. And they were willing to fight that um, uh, if the regime was going to contest them. And that's what happened for four years. Various clubs in Egypt, including Zamalek and uh, Ahli, the two foremost um, Cairo clubs, and the two most crowned African clubs, each formed their own group of militant soccer fans, as did teams uh, or fans of teams in various other Egyptian cities, including Port Suez, including uh, Ismailia, including Alexandria. And as these fans, and part of, part of their ethos was that they were fiercely independent. They paid their own way, and they would accept money from no one. And it was to be a member of the Ultras meant that you had to be present at every game your team played, no matter where in the world it was played. It also meant a very specific way of supporting your team, which was you didn't sit on the, on the terrace, you stood, you jumped up and down, you sang songs at a, at, at a very high pitch, and you used fireworks, uh, smoke guns, flares. Part of that was to support your team, part of that was to oppose or to intimidate your opponent. This was exactly what posed a threat to the autocratic leader, because it meant that groups were, were, were able to organize themselves and express themselves in a country in which self-organization and non-controlled expression uh, of, of whatever opinion was uh, fiercely, um, fiercely suppressed. And as a result, what you had was from the f day that the groups were formed in, t uh, in 2007, basically until the fall of Mubarak, or at least until the first um, uh, demonstrations on the 25th of January of last year, almost during football seasons, almost weekly clashes between the, um, the football fans and the security forces. In fact, in the case of al Ahli and Zamalek, the two Cairo arch rivals, uh, whenever a match was played, it was a, the stadium was a fortress that was ringed by black steel. Streets were, cut off, was, were closed down to ensure that the fans did not meet one another. Uh, referees were, had to be flown in from abroad. They couldn't be Egyptian. Um, and as a result of this, by the time that the demonstrations, uh, just before the 25th of January, but, uh, by the time the demonstrations were about to erupt in Egypt, the soccer fans were ready for this. In fact, on the 24th of January, the day before the first mass demonstrations against Mubarak, both the Zamalek and the al Ahli fans, who hated each other's guts, put out almost, sim uh, uh, almost identical statements on their Facebook pages. And what those statements said were, we are not part of this. We are not a political organization, but our members are free to participate. Privately, the message that went out from the leaders of the ultras to their followers was, this is your litmus test. 
this is the day we've been waiting for. We're talking about tens of thousands of ultras. What started in the mid-2000s as a, as a small group of the most militant fans of these clubs grew to organizations with tens of thousands of members. Many of those members were not as ideologically committed as the, um, as the original founders were. They were young, male, often uneducated, often unemployed, who were almost on a daily basis suffering the, uh, the abuse of the security forces in the various popular neighborhoods of Cairo and other Egyptian cities. And to them, the, uh, the police and security forces had, to, had come to resemble not only the regime and not only acting as the henchmen of the regime, but also as um, the force that was humiliating them, that was robbing them of their, di of their dignity. And the ultras were the only group in Egypt that was standing up to this force and that had demonstrated a degree of fearlessness, a degree of combativeness that appealed to them and they joined them en masse. Um, members of the ultras played a major role in, in the demonstrations that happened. They played a major role in breaking down the barrier of fear and breaking down, and that's the, that was the fear of the autocrat, the fear why for so many years uh, Egyptians and other Arabs did not rise up against totalitarian regimes. Breaking down that barrier of fear was basically done in two phases. Phase one was actually the willingness to leave your house and to go to, to Tahrir Square. This, no one had ever done this before. Certainly the huge mass of people that were on that square for 18 days, the vast majority had never gone out to raise their voice. One of the leaders of um, the Zamalik Ultras is a young man by the name of Muhammad Hassan. He's now 21. He's a computer engineering student. His, <clears throat> his ideal is to become a photographer. He's a small, you know, thin man, uh, has a three-day stubble, and he was in one of, on the 25th of January in the morning, he was in one of the neighborhoods, and he gathered about 300 people, and they marched towards Tahrir Square, and by the time that they got to the square, he was at the head of a group of 10,000 people, and they had smashed through seven police barri and security barricades of security forces. Other members of the Ultras were standing on rooftops at the entrances to other popular neighborhoods where the security forces had tried to close off the, uh, the exits and the entry points to the neighborhoods to prevent people from uh, going to the square. And it was Ultras who lobbed stones and Molotov cocktails at the security forces to force the, uh, uh, the opening of those uh, neighborhoods. So that was really the breaking down the first phase of the, uh, of the barrier of fear. And again, it was not just ultras, but ultras were very important in this role. Once they were on the square, there were two issues. If you really look at who was on that square, schematically, you can um, divide it up into three groups. There was this mass of people who were expressing their opposition to the regime, their uh, demands for social justice, their demands for an end to the tyranny. But they had never done anything like this before. They had never been organized like this before. There were the youth group of the Muslim Brotherhood who, in defiance of the Brotherhood's leadership, had decided to participate in the uh, demonstrations. And they had some degree of experience in uh, confrontation with the regime. And there were the ultras, who understood logistics and who understood street battles. And so it was the ultras <clears throat> who helped bring some degree of organization to what was a tense city 
of hundreds of thousands of people on a central square in the city. And maybe even more importantly, <coughs> it was the ultras who um, manned the perimeter of the square, the entrances, the front line. And so when the um, police, when the security forces on several days during, the during, the, during these 18 days and Mubarak loyalists attacked the, pro the protesters on the square, it was the ultras who were the first line of defense. For the mass major majority that was on the square and had never done this before, the, second, the, the question was, what do I do? Do I run for safety or do I stand my ground? And the fact that the ultras were there, that they were standing their ground, that they were respected because of the dedication to their soccer teams and because of their history of resistance against the re regime, <clears throat> many on that square decided if they're going to stand their ground, we're going to stand their ground. The, what the ultra's contribution went, however, much further. This is where their street battle experience came into play. They had rocket, rock, hur, uh, project, rock hurlers. They had qu quartermaster groups that were pr uh, supplying the projectiles on like clockwork. They had a group of, of, of so-called Sayadun, or hunters, who picked up tear gas canisters that the police threw into, onto the square and hold them right straight, straight back into the ranks of the police, something the police were not prepared for. When the, the demo, when on the 11th of February of last year, the, um, the demonstrators succeeding in forcing the resignation of Mubarak, for the ultras, initially, this was the moment to focus on soccer, which meant rooting out corruption within Egyptian soccer, forcing the resignation of uh, the <coughs> uh, <coughs> board of the Egyptian Football Association, uh, <coughs> forcing the board, uh, the resignation of boards of various of the soccer clubs that were aligned with the, the former regime of Mubarak. They succeeded in a few cases, in which, the, um, in which they forced in Ismaili, among other places, and in Alexandria, boards of clubs to resign. They didn't really succeed when it came to the Egyptian Football Association, nor did they succeed when it came to um, the boards of the major clubs like Al-Ahli and Zamalek. The ultras, much like the rest of Egypt, was willing to give the Egyptian military the benefit of the doubt. They had cheered the military, which had refused to, um, to intervene on, the, on behalf of Mubarak against the protesters while Mubarak was, stayed in, was still in office, and which ultimately, on the, on the 11th of February, forced Mubarak to leave office. But increasingly, they realized, as did many Egyptians, that uh, the military had its own agenda and was not necessarily going to unconditionally return to the barracks or try and or or, or um, uh, give up its political economic and other perks and privileges and as a result the ultras emerged as the most militant force opposed to military rule in Egypt it also meant that as Others within Egyptian society, the youth groups for primarily, but also others, continue, uh, uh, started to demonstrate against policies of the, uh, of the military regime and increasingly in favor of the immediate resignation of, or, or the immediate end to military rule. The ultras again were the shock troops of that movement. In throughout the first six months of the post-Mubarak period, there were repeated clashes between the ultras and the security forces in the stadiums and in uh, on Tahrir Square and in streets in the vicinity of uh, Tahrir Square. 
in September of last year that went as far as the ultras playing a key role in uh, the attack on or the, the occupation of the uh, Israeli embassy in Cairo. They also had played a key role very early on in, fe uh, in February of last year in the, ra in the ransacking and occupation of the offices of various, uh, or various offices of the state security services. By November of last year, the situation started to change. In late November, you had mass demonstrations on Tahrir Square of a whole variety of groups that um, opposed military regime. And on a Saturday afternoon at about 3 o'clock, um, it was becoming clear that the security forces were going to atta attack the, um, the protesters. Two things happened at that moment. One was calls went out to the ultras who were not on the square at that time to come to the square to protect the, um, uh, the protesters. And at the same time, as the, as the ultras realized that uh, something was going down, many of them felt that they had no choice but to volunteer to protect the demonstrators. They felt that they too long had been the subjects of abuse of humiliation and of violence by the security forces and therefore they could not tolerate that others would suffer the same. What happened though is that, the, that when the security forces clashed, clashed in fact the, the, the protests split into two. There were the protesters on Tahrir Square, a mass of people, and there were the ultras there were the youth groups and what, what Egyptians called the Wilad Sis, the unemployed, the uneducated youth, who in a, one of the streets close to um, uh, Tahrir Square fought pitched battles with the security forces. More than 50 or about 50 people were killed in, uh, in those battles that lasted for several days. Uh, hundreds were injured. But suddenly, there was really no relationship between the protesters on Tahrir Square and the ultras and the youth groups who were fighting, trying to occupy the Ministry of Interior, which to them was the signal, the symbol of, uh, or, or which to them would have been fully restoring their dignity. And the reason that there was um, uh, that divide between Tahrir Square and the street battles was that Egyptians had grown protest weary. The, the revolt that had toppled Mubarak had not produced immediate uh, results in terms of uh, better standards of living, greater economic opportunity, more employment. In fact, the economic situation was going downhill. Security was deteriorating. The police forces were simply standing aside the police, in, in terms of neighborhood security, in terms of crime, uh, because they, didn't, they realized that their image had been severely tarnished, and they felt that if they stepped into the background that would, and, and were not the, uh, uh, on the front line, that maybe that would contribute to improving their image, and that moreover, if the security situation deteriorated, then obviously it, people would realize that without the police uh, and without law and order, Egypt would deteriorate into chaos and anarchy. In the weeks that followed what was a sobering experience to the, um, uh, for the ultras and for the, um, the youth groups, they launched a campaign to try and convince public opinion that the military was a brutal force and that what they were standing for was in Egypt's national interest. And so they would go into neighborhoods, they would set up big screens, uh, and they would show videos of the violence that had gone on in the various confrontations between the ultras and the youth groups and the security forces. The problem was that people would stand on their balconies 
and they would look down, but nobody responded. In fact, the, Egypt, the, the, the ultras and the youth groups were, lose, were losing the battle. As in most transitions, uh, it's, street it's street politics and contentious politics that brings down the autocratic leader. It's then the vested interests, the established political parties, and ultimately electoral politics that fills the void that then that, that, that has been created by the fall of the leader. To some degree, the ultras were lucky because they were dealing with a military leadership that was inept and made continuously one mistake after the other. One of the most serious mistakes it probably made was uh, in early February of this year when Al Ahli, the other um, Cairo team, played a match in Port Said. At the end of that match, a soccer brawl broke out. And when it was all over, 74 supporters of Al Ahli were dead. It was the worst incident in Egyptian sporting history. We may never know what really happened there, but there's sub substantial circumstantial evidence to show that at the very least, the government and the security forces were guilty of negligence. But more probably, they were guilty of escalating, either escalating what started as a brawl or maybe even initiating a brawl. The situation had been such as judged by the military and by the security forces, that they were in a position in which they could afford to teach the ultras a lesson. I don't think that anyone had planned 74 people dead. I'm not sure that anyone had planned that, 70, that anyone would be killed. But it certainly was a scene in which a thorough thrashing was judged to be appropriate. And it was a scene that got out of hand. That incident and the shock of what happened fueled public empathy with the ultras and with the, um, with the uh, youth groups. It didn't last for long, as is evident in the, um, um, in the outcome of the, last, of, of the presidential election last year, which has really pitted two of the old regime forces, with other words, the military and the Muslim Brotherhood, in a runoff for the, pre for the presidency next month. What the revolt did do is it changed to some degree, and that relates to the barrier of fear, Egyptian attitudes. Attitudes that are going to take a long time to, um, to change, both because they are rooted in, the, in cultural norms and cultural mores that are not only common to Egypt but are common to the region, and they're rooted in what makes Egypt, or, or what makes Arab autocracies and dictatorships very different from those we've seen in other parts of the world. And the difference is what a Palestinian American um, scholar who passed away several years by the name of Hisham Sharabi described in a book that he published in 1992 called Neo Patriarchy, a book that is banned until today in most of the Arab world. Shirabi argued that an Arab dictatorship was a franchise with a father figure at the top. And the authoritarian father, and, and, the, and the, 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 the model of the authoritarian father figure was replicated throughout society. The ministers, the provincial governors, the mayors, the head of the nuclear family. As a result of that, if you, take, you, if you look at what autocratic leaders like Mubarak, uh, or Ben Ali in Tunisia, or Gaddafi in Libya, Libya said in the weeks and months in which they struggled to stay in office unsuccessfully, their statements are expressions of disbelief, disbelief that the children would rise up against them and behave this way. Disbelief 
in the fact that their authority was being challenged. That internalized father figure model was was visible in uh, the in what in the statements uh, of supporters of Mubarak, for example, during the um, the 18 days of the demonstrations. The national coach of the Egyptian national team, a crowned soccer player who had led the national team to three successful African championship titles, or Ibrahim Hassan, a board member of Zamalek, uh, and again a crowned soccer player in his days, all came out in favor of Mubarak. Ibrahim Hassan went as far as calling for a cutoff of the medical and um, food supplies to Tahrir Square. But the key thing was what they said, and that was not that Mubarak is the best thing that sliced bread, since I sliced bread. What they said is, we agree with the protesters. We're fed up with the nepotism. We're fed up with the corruption. But there must be a way in which we don't humiliate the father. I want to very briefly touch on some of the other battlefields, and again, we can go into this in, in, the, in the question and answer session. Soccer is a battlefield for na national identity. It's a battlefield for ethnic identity. It's a battlefield for sectarian identity. Uh, just look at, in, um, in about 10 days' time, you, ha you have the World Cup of the Homeless in Kurdistan. That's where soccer teams play from places like Kurdistan, which unsuccessfully, or which uses soccer as a way to project, project northern Iraq's national identity. The no Kurdish Football Association has for, ye for years unsuccessfully campaigned trying to convince FIFA to, um, to allow it to join, just like Palestine did. In that World Cup for the Homeless, you have national teams from places, some of them some you've heard, some of them you've heard of, some of them you haven't, but they include Darfur, they include the West, Western uh, Sahara, they include the Sami in northern Finland, and others. Palestine's membership in, in FIFA was a key part of the, uh, of, the, of the Palestinian campaign to be recognized as an independent state. In fact, today, it's the head of, for, of uh, Arafat Secret Services and, 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 and uh, Intelligence Services who heads both the Palestinian Football Association and the Palestinian uh, Olympic Committee, and who, alongside the Prime Minister and alongside uh, Mahmoud Abbas, sees sports as the key tool alongside uh, diplomacy, and particularly soccer, as a way of gaining that nation nationhood. It's also a key identity element for Israeli Palestinians. And the battle on the Israeli soccer fields is often one of, on the one hand, uh, particularly in the case of Beitar Jerusalem, one of rabid opposition by fans to both Palestinians and Ashkenazi Jews, and I'm not sure that they've decided which of the two they hate most. But when in, I think 2005, it was a Palestinian player, Palestinian Israeli player on the, um, uh, on the national team who scored a goal in Ireland that for the first time gave Israel a chance of qualifying for the World Cup. He returned to Israel he had achieved what pol politicians for years had not been able to achieve, which was to rally the country, uh, uh, both J Jews and Palestinians, around a popular figure. His face was on advertisements on billboards. But when he played his first match for his own club, Bnei Sakhnin, uh against Beitar Jerusalem, the shouts on the, um, on the pitch were, you're not one of us, Arabs go home, and insults to Islam. 
More recently, fans of Beitar Jerusalem in the last two months attacked the mall in Jerusalem and beat up every Palestinian shopper and worker that they could see. When a few days later, they were marching down a street towards the stadium and a Jewish Israeli musician protested, a woman protested against uh, their, uh, their, their militancy and their racism, she was beaten up. In fact, the brutalizing effect of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza is increasingly being seen on the soccer pitch, where the violence is not only between uh, Palestinians and Israelis, but also among Israelis themselves, with not only fans getting into soccer brawls, but players of various different teams. Palestine has not only a, a men's team, it also has a women's team. That team is 18 girls, 14 of them are Christians, four of them are Muslims. The Christian girls encounter the same social problems in family and in society that Muslim girls do, which illustrates the fact that the opposition that one finds in the Middle East, and which goes as far as Saudi Arabia refusing to, ha to encourage women's sports or to introduce physical education in, uh, in its schooling system, is not a religious issue. It's a cultural issue that is inherent to the region. Several months ago, the women's national team, or the, women, the world champion, women's champion, Japan, visited the West Bank. And the two friendly matches were held in the two most conservative towns in the territory. The first one was held in Hebron. The Hamas mayor of Hebron welcomed the match and supported the women's team. Hezbollah Tahrir shouted from the minarets of the mosques that the members of the, um, uh, of the women's team were prostitutes. Teachers in schools warned their students that if they went to see the match, they would be, uh, uh, they would be grabbed by the devil. The Palestinian Football Association had to hire buses, 60 buses with police protection, to um, bus in supporters into the stadium in Hebron. The Palestinian women's team lost 19 to 0. But what they had achieved was a social revolution. Because when they, even as losers, and as having been terribly beaten, left the stadium. Conservative Hebron, a town that has no Christian minority, was on the streets to cheer them. And they recovered some of their, um, uh, their prestige when in Nablus, the second most conservative town on the West Bank, they played again against the Japanese team and they lost only 4-0. Let me leave it at this um, and we can address a lot of the other issues uh, in question and answer. Thank you. All right, I'd like... To... All right, we'd like to move... All right, I'd like... There we go. I'd like to move on to our question and answer session. Um, Mr. Alan Black would like to ask uh, Mr. Dorsey how do the authorities manipulate the divisions between clubs and Egypt? Go ahead, sir. Do the authorities manipulate the divisions between clubs and Egypt? Go ahead, sir. I, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hear the question. Sorry about that. Um, okay, let me...
Okay, uh, Miss, me, uh, Mr. Dorsey, the question... As I see them here on the... Uh, sorry? Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and go through the questions as you see them there on the board. Right. Uh, in, uh, in response to Dr. Notwell, yes, they are an anti-establishment force. They are essentially ultras by and large. I was a while ago in Turkey where I visited with a, um, uh, a, an ultras group in Istanbul. They define themselves as against being, uh, as anarchists and as against being uh, as against the establishment. I think that the difference, however, between, and, and there are many people who try and draw a comparison between European hooligans, for example, and the ultras in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I think the difference between the two is that in, and I'm less versed about European hooligans, but what I, what I, what I see of them is that they are often marginalized groups but they operate in a society in which there is a multitude of opportunities and different ways of expressing your opinion uh, and of campaigning for whatever it is you want to campaign. In Egypt, that was not the case. Soccer, probably, I was asked once at a uh, seminar by someone if what I was arguing meant that uh, a soccer fan would be uh, would be the next president of Egypt, and my response was, if you're asking me whether an ultra will be the next president of Egypt, no. But if you're asking me if a soccer fan will be the next president of Egypt, most probably yes, because you're talking about at least 95 percent of the population. In fact, uh, there was a study done last year for the first time in Egypt about reasons for divorce. And the reason that came out as being the, uh, the foremost reason for divorces in Egypt was soccer. Because if you were the wife, you were either, you know, or if, if you were the husband, if the choice was between a meal on the table and a soccer ticket, it was a soccer ticket. And if the choice was between vacation and staying home to watch the soccer game, you stayed home. So if you were the wife, you either were as fanatic and as enthusiastic about soccer as the husband, or you were extremely tolerant, or you, there was just a point where you got enough of it. Um, let me just go through here further. Um, in, in, um, In response to Mr. Thomas, uh, or Thomas Allen, um, I'm not saying, I've, I've used Egypt as an example, primarily because that's where the ultras are the most developed. Egypt's not the first country where, in the Middle East and North Africa where ultra, ultras uh, were founded. It was actually Morocco. And you'll find militant soccer groups across the region. You'll also find that stadiums across the region are battlefields. In fact, if you look at Algeria today, the protests early last year spilled out of the stadium into the streets of Algiers and other Algerian cities, and then they went back into the stadiums. And if you go today to a soccer match in Algiers, it is a massive protest against the regime. There's sort of a tacit understanding between the security forces and the regime that as long as the soccer fans remain in the stadium, uh, they'll be allowed to, um, to, to, to have their protests. The fear is not if, but, wh but when these manifestations will, will, um, um, will spill back out onto the streets. Okay, I'm just looking at Joshua Cook's question. Um, There's, in terms of the, the, the organization of the structure, it's, first of all, a lot of these, you know, the, you've got a central group, uh, and in many cases, you've got subgroups. Um, 
in various parts of a city, maybe even in various parts of the country. And these groups often operate semi-independently. It's a consultative process. There's a core group, usually the founders, um, and there's the rank and file. I spent last year at one point a weekend or several days, a total of 30 hours with the Zamalek group. And it was in the run-up to the um, first match post-revolt in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt between uh, Zamalek and um, Esperance Sportive de Tunis. On the eve, the uh, ultras were perfectly prepared for a confrontation with the police forces. They weren't going to look for it, but they weren't going to back down in terms of uh, bringing into the stadium the materials, the fireworks, etc., that they always did during matches. On the eve of the match, the police phoned them and warned them that they wouldn't be allowed to do so. But when the ultras got to the stadium that day, the Cairo Stadium, they were in for a surprise. There was no police. There was no one at the gates. They could freely walk in, take in whatever they had. There were 30 security men, all dressed in light blue training tracksuits, no batons, no weapons, no guns. They were there to protect the handful of Tunisian, um, of Tunisian supporters. In the 90th minute of the game, after 90 minutes of I barely saw much of the game because of the smoke and the fireworks. The ultras were upset about the decision of the referee. And they stormed the pitch. And when it was all over, there was nothing that wasn't destroyed on the pitch. And if you um, were, weren't, weren't able to get off the pitch on time, you had the scars to show it. But what had happened was that the, the split within the ultras was becoming evident. The cheerleader on that day was not one of the uh, core founders. It was a mesmerizingly charismatic young man who had no job and relatively little education. He represented the rank and file, the tens of thousands of people, of young men who had joined the, the ranks of the uh, ultras over the years. And this was the first time that they really had full control of the stadium, and they went berserk. Um, I'm not sure that I'm doing all of these questions in, in, in the pro appropriate order, but I'm trying to go from top to bottom. Um, let me see, uh, this is a question by uh, Professor Prinslow. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, I think that as a matter of principle, soccer is political. Um, I don't know enough about the history of um, soccer games, or, or soccer in Latin America or Africa, or sub most of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but I, 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 will t I will say two things. Uh, one of the things that I don't know but which is true for the Middle East, and that is that virtually every soccer club in the region, and the region is not only Arab, it includes Turkey, it includes Iran, it includes Israel, is political in its inception. The arch rivalry between Zamalek and Ahli goes back to their founding. Al-Ahli was the club of the, of the Republicans, of the anti-colonial British of the anti-British colonial uh, forces, of the nationalists. Zamalek was the club of, it was the King's Club ultimately, and the club of the British colonial administrators. The perceptions of those differences live until today. They don't, they're no longer founded in reality. The Egyptian monarchy is, was deposed 60 years ago. The fan base, the, the social, the demography of the fan bases is very similar today. 
and very different from what it, from what it was more than a century ago. But nonetheless, those rivalries exist. And it was the only thing that ever brought the fan groups of these two teams together was their joint opposition and opportunity to overthrow Mubarak. Nothing else in the history of these clubs had ever brought them together. The other remark I'll make, it, which, which goes to Mubarak, and, uh, which goes a bit to Africa, is that jihadists have a love-hate relationship with soccer. Ironically, when it came to soccer, Osama bin Laden was a moderate. He was a fanatic soccer fan. He organized soccer tournaments among his people. And he understood the bonding and recruitment uh, uh, advantages of soccer, as did, or as does Ismail Haniya of Hamas, a former soccer player, or for that matter, Hassan Nasrallah of um, Hezbollah. And these are men who were ideologically opposed to a tendency among jihadists which sees soccer as the infidel's game, as a distraction from Muslim, um, uh, from Muslim, uh, from, the, from the exercise of, of uh, uh, religious obligations, and as introducing an element of competition. And that you do see in various African countries, whether it's the Shabab in Somalia, whether it's some of the Islamist groups in northern Ma that have taken over northern Mali um, um, and have banned soccer, or whether it's the um, Boko Haram in, um, in Nigeria. Uh, the Arabic name for, for, um, for ultras is ultras. Uh, in fact, the one book that was published in Arabic about the ultras by the, by the, the founding father of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the movement in the Arab world is called Al Altras. Um, let me go a little bit further down and then I'll go f back up to so I can um, uh, answer some of the people who I believe asked questions earlier. Um, in, in response to Alan Black, Black I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that it has replaced affinity um, to religious institutions. Uh, a lot of these, you know, a lot, the Arab world counts very few atheists. Everybody believes in some form or fashion, and so do ultras. Um, what I was saying in terms of the mosque and the, um, and the soccer pitch was actually more complementary than uh, trying to create a divergence, and that was that those two institutions were the only two institutions that... Um, offered a venue for the release of pent-up anger and frustration. Uh, religious, you know, in terms of affinity with the, with the state, there was very little affinity with the state because the state was seen as oppressive. It was seen as uh, corrupt. It was seen as despotic. Um, in terms of the um, divide and rule, um, I don't, you know, it wasn't so much a question of divide and rule. Soccer passions were there. And the, uh, the, the, the fervent support for this or that club goes down in, um, you know, is handed down from father to son. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, can split families when sons decide to su support another team. The way control was ex exerted was one, um, the, na the, the association boards were government controlled. The uh, boards of clubs were populated with supporters of the regime, often people who benefited from the regime. The problem that the regime had was not with the boards, not with the, uh, the association, it was, the it was with the fans because that was the one independent group that, refu sorry, that refused to be, um, uh, be, be controlled by the regime. Uh, in, um, 
I, I think to some degree I've answered the question of Claire Metellitz. Again, I'm, I, I, I don't, you know, to be able to answer the question, uh, you, one really has to have a, a, a significant understanding of the political and social fabric of a country. Um, on the principle of Socrates, the more you know, the less you know. I have some sense of that in the Middle East and North Africa. I have, have despite having covered part, uh, a great part of Africa over periods of time, I have less sense of that and, and therefore don't want to venture down that road. Interesting that, uh, that, that Italy is, um, has, um, uh, or that the government in Italy has proposed um, suspending soccer for three years. It's hard to believe that they will get that passed. Um, but again, I, you know, when, when I, I would need to know more about Italy, and I hadn't seen the report until now. Um, thanks a lot, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, let me just go look through here. Uh, in terms of the linkages, those linkages are fairly clear. Um, as the original founders of the Ultras were surfing the internet, um, 2003, 2004, 2005, they came across like-minded groups in Russia, in Argentina, but particularly in, the, in um, uh, Italy and in um, uh, Serbia. And in fact, in some cases, that friendships were forged. Some ultras have served girlfriends. Uh, so those, those relationships are very real. Um, in terms of racism, uh, r racism as a matter of principle is a problem in the Middle East, not just, um, you know, not just among soccer uh, fans. Um, racism towards blacks, uh, toward you know, the, obviously because of the conflict with Israel towards Jews, you see very little of that expressed on uh, on the soccer pitch. Uh, most of of what you see politically expressed on the soccer pitch in the Middle East and North Africa, and Israel is an exception to that. Turkey is an exception to that. But then you're talking about societies that have other problems. Uh, is really political and focused on 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 the regime. Um, let's see. I don't think that uh, in response to um, uh, James Hunt, I, I I don't think that social media as such contributed to radicalization. What contributed, you know, we can talk at, at greater length about the role of social media, which on the one hand, I think, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't describe the revolts that we're seeing throughout the Middle East and North Africa as Facebook revolts or Twitter revolts. Um, social media clearly contributed to um, or accelerated communication, uh, but the discontent was there and was going to boil, boil over at one point or the other. What contributed to the radicalization of the ultras was very much what contributed to uh, the radicalization of anti-Vietnam students in the late 1960s, and that was a police baton. You know, in, in, in the 1960s, the, the, the yardstick was every police baton uh, created a reader of Das Kapital by Marx, and that's in many ways what happened in the stadiums in um, in, in Egypt and in elsewhere in the in the Arab world, but not only in the stadiums, it happened. You know, it was also a product of what happened in the um, popular neighborhoods. I think we have I think we have time for just one more question, okay. if we would, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Sorry. Okay, let me um, go to the top then, and I. Um, let's see. Okay, no, that I've answered. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, in, resp in response to Mario Hoffman, sure, in, without question in various parts of the world, uh, soccer is used by various political groups, and it's used, again, uh, by regimes and by political groups in the Middle East and North Africa. The difference that I'm trying to, to portray here is that even given that, we're talking about certainly pre-revolt societies that were extremely controlled in which there was no breathing space, um, as the soccer fans articulated in the uh, second video that I showed at the beginning of this. With other words, there were only two places for them to express pent-up anger and frustration. And one was the mosque and the other was the soccer pitch. Do you want me to answer any more questions? Or I think for uh, the sake of time and the, the out of courtesy to our guests, if we can go ahead and wrap it up, if you don't mind, sir. If, if you'd like to answer another question, please feel free. I, I think I've answered most of them, if not all of them. Uh, let me just see. Uh, uh, no, it's not that... It's not that uh, any of the uh, soccer fan groups are aligned with any one political party or political trend. They're, they've come together on the basis of their support for the club, and those bonds have been substantially tightened by virtue of the confrontations that they, um, uh, that they fought with the police over the years and their opposition to the regime. But various, you know, there is no way of saying, telling who within a, a soccer group is going to vote for whom. I think the one thing that I would assume is, the only thing that I would assume one can say with any certainty is that it wasn't ultras that voted for Ahmed Shafiq in the last, or the first round of the Egyptian presidential elections. Well, great. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, based on the feedback that we're getting in the chat windows, it looks like uh, everybody appreciated uh, the, this discussion. Uh, for the rest of you, if you would have uh, go to www.culturalknowledge.org, please visit, uh, register, and if you'd like to be kept abreast of the future speaker series, those will be posted there. And you can also take advantage of the, the blogs, the forums, and the research resources uh, on the CKC portal. Do you have any uh, parting comments, uh, Mr. Dorsey? No. Well, thank you very much for um, taking the time to listen to me. I hope it was useful. And um, if any of you have further questions, my email is on my blog, and I'll be happy to address them. Thank you very much for uh, joining me tonight. Thank you very much, sir. Just as an uh, admin note, if any of you uh, would like w had problems getting on, or if you know someone that had problems getting on, uh, we'll have more information for the next iteration about uh, how to uh, download and install the DoD certificates, and uh, b so that we get uh, some more participation. Thank you very much, and that is all. Thank you.